welcome. Today, let us start looking at steady state radial diffusion across tubular walls. Okay. To recall a little bit, we are looking at mass flux. We said that there are two major uh, aspects or two major approaches to solve relevant problems in this area. One is through what is called a shell balance approach. We write material balances over a representative shell for the system of interest and then use those balances to get to uh, useful expressions which can give us insights and will also help us in uh, first design then operation of these systems. We uh, earlier uh, did both these approaches while doing the uh, conservation equation approach, we derived the conservation equation that is necessary for us to do uh, this approach. And then we applied that to a membrane, um, a cuboidal membrane let us say thin membrane uh, and uh, therefore, we could use the rectangular Cartesian coordinate system to analyze that situation. That of course, has very many different applications as we have already seen in the last class. Uh, in this class, we will start looking at the application of uh, the same steady state diffusion. Steady state means the properties at a particular point in the system do not change with time. Steady state diffusion uh, across tubular walls. So, the system is going to be a cylindrical system. Uh, cylindrical system therefore, we need to use cylindrical coordinates and so on. Before we start doing that, I think I need to tell you something about the way I teach, uh, because uh, we have gone through quite a few lectures in this course. Uh, some of you may would have uh, may have found this very easy, uh, may have felt that I was repeating too many things and so on and so forth, whereas others may have felt a little lost. Okay. Both are very natural. The majority would have uh, felt fine with it. This I can say with confidence uh, based on experience honed by uh, feedback that I have uh, received both uh, in earlier courses done in this fashion, uh, the NPTEL courses, I have done about four already, um, as well as I have uh, through classroom teaching and so on and so forth, where we get direct feedback. Feedback can be of many forms, uh, one is direct feedback, then we get to see how people have understood based on the performance of the exam, based on the way they answer uh, questions in class, the way they understand things in class and so on and so forth. Based on all those things, uh, I have a pretty good idea to teach at the uh, at a certain level, where a majority of students would feel comfortable, whereas these two would also happen. Let us try to understand that a little better, so that um, you know the expectations can be appropriately honed, and uh, you could tune your approach to this course to get the maximum out of this course. I also have an interest in the learning process and therefore, I spend time understanding these things. This is from a published paper uh, or the work towards a published paper which is subsequently published. So, let us look at the learning aspects. In a group or in a population if you want to call it so of anything beyond 15 to 20 people, 15 to 20 students. Whatever I am going to say is uh, very nicely valid. If you plot the number of students or number of people in the population under consideration uh, uh, on the y axis and what I call the relevant abilities on the x axis, it is typically uh, a variation in the form of a Gaussian curve that you see here, you know the bell shaped curve. What this means is that there are a few who have uh, lower relevant abilities, there are a few who have high relevant abilities and a majority of the population will have an average ability, uh, will have an ability at a certain level which can be considered as the average ability of the population. Okay. The, uh, the most number of students as indicated 
by this point on the y axis. This is what you see time and again you can uh, say it with confidence sometimes this is slight skew and all that let us not get into that. Uh, but this is a very good first approximation to make for this kind of uh, uh, behavior for this kind of an, uh, an insight that we are trying to get into a population. By relevant abilities I mean the following it could be knowledge in a domain it could be high learning that is analysis application and synthesis skills. It could be also something called effective skills the attitude that you bring to learning. It could also include psychomotor skills how good you are with your hands to get things done and so on and so forth. I am looking at some sort of a combination of these aspects towards learning transport phenomena alone that is what I mean by relevant abilities. I am going to limit the relevant abilities to the, those that are uh, appropriate for this course and therefore, let me say the relevant abilities to the transport phenomena in biological processes course or biological systems course. Okay. So, you see a distribution something like this between number of students and relevant abilities and as I said earlier you could draw a line here and you could call the students who have a higher set of abilities as people on the right or right students and uh, let us say the students who have lower than the relevant abilities as left students. This is natural there is nothing wrong about it this is the way a population behaves and majority of people are here and majority of the learners of this course would also be here I can say it with full confidence. There are various strategies that we employ uh, I may not have told you much, but there are so many strategies that have gone into the design of this course the way I present the course and so on and so forth. And most of those strategies are for improving the learning of the majority of students who are at the average level. I have done some work on improving the learning of the right students as well as improving the learning of the left students and some of those are also included in a way in this uh, course. This medium does not allow uh, the numbers especially the huge numbers does not allow me to effectively handle uh, the right students or the left students exclusively which I do in a normal class. I can handle up to let us say 80, 90 or 100 students. and uh, take care of these people uh, very clearly uh, of course, I do not mention who they are in the class and so on and so forth, but I, I know and I can take care of these people through uh, ways uh, which I have developed over many years. Unfortunately, I cannot do that here. Okay. So, let, let me uh, be satisfied with addressing the most number of students the numbers of these and these students the right and left students are small anyway as given by this distribution or as shown by this distribution. I teach at this level and this, uh, this I have gained through experience and feedback. I know uh, intuitively how to teach at this level and that is what I do here. Students who are right students would find this boring. Okay. They would uh, they would have uh, gotten whatever I said in the first go and they would feel that uh, why is this person repeating so much, okay. but that is part of the deal it is a class that I am addressing. And then there are these left students who genuinely will feel lost. Okay. These students need to put in that extra effort go over the material a few more times that is all is needed uh, you, you go over the material a few more times and then it will become an order it will become much easier. This is only for transport phenomena the people who are here for transport phenomena may be very good in something else which I mean not even uh, you know I, I might completely be bad at. So, it is entirely dependent on the particular aspect that we are interested that we are focusing on in this case transport phenomena that is all. Uh, some of my left students are very good sports people some of, uh, some of my left students are very good uh, art artists musicians and so on and so forth. And some of my left students do very well in other courses whereas, they might find uh, the requirements of this course not to their orientation that is it uh, there is nothing wrong with it. 
So, that is the uh, way uh, the things are. Uh, I teach here and people who are here um, probably can um, move forward at a faster pace. You do not have to, you can fast forward things and look at things. In a typical class, in a face to face class, I give exercises which take care of these students. Unfortunately, those exercises cannot be given on uh, a very large number kind of a situation. Uh, the left students, the only suggestion that I have is please go through the material a few times and that should be, uh, that should help you significantly. Okay. What typically happens in this course as well as in standard courses that we give in classrooms is that we have a limited time of a semester where we have this material, the students need to pick up this material. If we had had unlimited time, then we could give enough time, uh, give enough uh, grooming and so on and so forth, help, things like that. So, that even the person who finds it the most difficult can get to a certain degree of uh, expertise to be uh, comfortable in the course or, or to reach a certain level of expertise in the course. But unfortunately, we do not have this unlimited time. We have a limited time typically of a semester. Therefore, what we do is we use grades to differentiate between students and so on and so forth. Personally, I do not like it, but that is the practical way in which things happen because mainly because of the limited time. Ideally, we would like to like things to be this way. If you look at the same graph, the number of students versus the relevant abilities. Before the start, before the start of the course, if the distribution was something like this, at the end of the course, I would like the distribution to move to the right of course, because I would like the students to have picked up the abilities relevant for the transport phenomena in biological systems and a narrowing of the distribution. So, that the difference between uh, the left students and the right students is minimized. This is what I am actually after and this is what I do in all my courses. I try to do this in this course in a certain way given the limitations of this format. Okay. So, I thought I should let you know this so that the expectations are clear and your approach is appropriate to get the best out of this course. Okay, Let us uh, move forward. Okay, steady state diffusion across tubular walls is uh, what we are going to look at. And one of the strategies uh, that we normally use, I am telling you this openly here, I am not going to do that in each part of the course. There are so many strategies and they have all been uh, worked out in a certain way uh, that if you look at a certain way of doing things, there might be several different strategies associated with it. So, I am not going to do that and since we just talked about it, let me tell you the strategy. There is something called problem based learning. Problem based learning presents a problem first and gives you the information to uh, understand the material itself in the context of that problem. That is what problem based learning is and that is what I have, uh, that is one of the things that I have done in this course even in this format to improve the learning and this is the way I do it. I throw the problem at you, you think about it, you form your thoughts about it. And that also uh, triggers a few modes of learning which are normally absent when you just give the information. And then of course, we pick up the information strategies and so on that are required to solve that and thereby we learn something more basic and that hopefully improves understanding, application and so on and so forth. Okay. Fine. Uh, I may not mention many of the strategies that I normally use, just this one. Let us get back to this. The problem here is in certain conditions of respiratory difficulty, uh, high time, uh, I mean very apt now given the COVID-19 uh, situation. In certain conditions of respiratory difficulty, a drug is administered through the nasal cavity continuously at an appropriate dose to reach the lung tissue by passing across the bronchial wall. You all know this, you are all bio people, therefore you know that the air goes through the trachea and then uh, through the bronchi and there which branches on to the bronchioles which ends up in the alveoli and that is what supplies the, that is where the gas exchange happens 
between the air and the blood through the which pass through the blood vessels that line the alveoli. Okay. We are looking at these cylindrical bronchioles, especially the bronchial wall. Okay. So, this is fed given continuously at an appropriate dose to reach the lung tissue by passing across the bronchial wall. The concentration of the drug in the air present in the lumen of the bronchiole is C B at steady state. The drug concentration in the lung tissue on the other side of the bronchial wall is needed to be C 0 for effectiveness. In this case, we are just looking at the bronchial, we have not gone to the alveoli level. Uh, so, inside the bronchial it is C B and it has to be C 0 on the other side of the bronchial wall uh, for effectiveness. The inner and outer radii of the bronchiole are R B and R 0 respectively derive an expression for the radial drug flux at the inner wall of the bronchiole that is needed to ensure effectiveness of the drug. Okay. If you want you can pause the video here read it once more to understand to make a picture of what is happening here. I have provided some picture you can complete the picture in your own minds. Okay. Pause go ahead. Okay. Hopefully, you are you have a picture of uh, the situation here in your minds clearly. Now, let us look at this, the solution. So, this is the cross section of the bronchiole, you know bronchiole is like this tubular, if you cut across it is going to look at look as and you cut across and look at it from the side, it is going to look as two concentric circles, the outer radius at R 0 from here and the inner radius of the bronchial wall being R B. Okay. This is the inner uh, part, this is the outer part and the hashed portion is the bronchial wall. We are interested in the drug passing through the bronchial wall from the lumen the inside of the bronchial to the outside of the bronchial. This is a cylindrical system as you could see and therefore, it may be easier to work with cylindrical coordinates. Yes, it is going to be easier to work with cylindrical coordinates. If you draw a rectangular Cartesian coordinate system, how would you handle the variation in these curved paths and that becomes very messy. That is the reason why we have a totally different coordinate system to handle these aspects. So, the system is uh, the bronchial wall which is already hashed here. The species is the drug that transfers from here to here and let us write a mass balance of the species on our system, our system is a bronchial wall. Okay. And here uh, we have already uh, derived gone through the pain, we have derived something that can be directly applied and we have it of the form that can be directly applied in cylindrical coordinate system in the table that was given to you earlier. Okay. Hopefully, you have made a copy of that table you could refer to that and if you look at that table equation B 2 table 2.3.2 dash 1 it will be something like this ok. Do C i do t plus V r do C i do r plus V theta 1 by r do C i do theta plus V z do C i do z minus d i the diffusivity the, uh, times 1 by r do do r r do C i do r plus 1 by r squared dou squared c i dou theta squared plus dou squared c i dou z squared equals r i. Okay. You do not have to remember any of this, you already have that in the table, you just uh, see that it fits in, this is the cylindrical coordinate system. Therefore, that form of the material balance equation needs to be valid and therefore, we take it directly here. Okay. Okay. Now, let us start seeing which of these terms are relevant in this particular case. Okay. Let me start you out. This of course, is 0 any this is a steady state situation we are analyzing and therefore, any time derivative is set to 0. We already know that there is no fluid motion, okay. there is fluid motion of course, the air is flowing, flowing in the lumen in the axial direction or the z direction there is certainly a flow. But that z direction is not the direction of interest for us, we are looking at the r direction for the transport. Therefore, in that direction there is no motion, there is no bulk motion, 
there is no convective motion of the fluid. And as long as you do not have bulk motion, convective motion, the motion of the fluid itself, these velocities which correspond to such motion can directly be set to 0. Okay. In fact, in the entire chapter uh, here, these terms will be 0, these will come in only in the 6th chapter just to uh, make it clear to you. These are convec convective uh, or uh, bulk motion parameters v r, v theta and v z, they would all be 0 uh, till we get to the sixth, to the last chapter. Okay. So, uh, if you have, uh, I hope you have understood the bulk motion convective motion part of it, the fluid itself needs to move and these are the velocity components of the fluid motion. Even though the fluid is not moving the across the wall, the species is moving by diffusion, right? I hope you got that. Okay, so, because of that V r is 0, V theta is 0 and V z is 0 and these need to be r theta V r V theta V z and C i the concentration of the drug in the wall okay, that is what C i is needs to be the same at a certain radial position uh, at all the angular positions. right? Therefore, C i is not a function of theta and therefore, that goes to 0. There is a radial symmetry here. At any radius, if you look at the concentration of the drug, it has to be the same. Similarly, we are not interested in the z aspect at all. We assume that there is no change in the concentration of the drug over the length of the bronchiole that we are considering and therefore, uh, of the length of the system that is the bronchiolar wall that we are considering and therefore, that goes to 0. Right. So, this is not the lumen, this is the z axis of the system which is the bronchial wall. There is no uh, variation in concentration, we are considering a situation where there is no variation in concentration of the drug in the lumen and therefore, there can be no variation of the concentration of the drug in the wall and therefore, that goes to 0. And of course, there is no reaction happening here, it is a simple diffusion, a simple transport of uh, the drug from the inside of the lumen to the outside of the lumen and therefore, that goes to 0. So, in one step we have just by cancelling the terms, we have the relevant equation that we need to consider and that makes it simple. You could also do a shell balance, you needed to have considered a um, cylindrical shell in this space and then did balances over it and then arrived at this, you, do, uh, you would have arrived at the same thing after about 4 pages of working. Okay. So, it is a little cumbersome that is all, but we ha already have this and there is no uh, difficulties of the kind that we mentioned earlier, change in area and so on and so forth, therefore, this is fine. So, this is the equation that we need to work with, this is the only term remaining d i 1 by r dou dou r r dou c i dou r equals 0. This is a differential equation, okay, but even before that, here r is the only independent variable, it is moving here, there is no variation in theta, there is no variation in z, the other two there is no variation. Since it is only independent variable, the partial derivatives can be replaced with total derivatives, that is only variable that is going to vary. Therefore, I am just replacing the partials with the total d i 1 by r d d r r d c i d r equals 0. Let us call this equation 2.4.2 dash 1 and um, we this being a differential equation we need to uh, boundary conditions. This is a second order differential equation, so we need two boundary conditions to solve. The boundary conditions are at uh, r equals r b which is the inside wall C A which is the concentration of the drug in the membrane is k times the concentration of the drug in the lumen. Right? This is the partition coefficient, we have already seen the concept of a partition coefficient earlier. So, just take the same thing or if you need to understand that go back to the previous problem the uh, diffusion across the uh, flat membrane and then understand the partition coefficient. Equa this is equation 2.4.2 dash 2 the boundary condition 
the other boundary condition is on the other side at r equals r o which is the outer wall c a equals k c 0, c 0 needs to be the concentration here therefore, the concentration on the membrane would be the partition coefficient times c 0 and that is what this is we will call this equation 2.4.2 dash 3. Right. For completeness the ratio of the drug concentrations in the two phases at equilibrium and of course, we have already identified those in the figure. Okay. Now, let us solve this the derivative the whole thing being equal to 0 right that is what this is implies that this derivative needs to be a constant. So, uh, a, con a derivative the um, uh, derivative of a constant of course, is 0 uh, and that is the way by which this whole expression can be equal to 0 and therefore, r d c i d r has to be a constant r d c a d r I call it a here the concentration on the membrane a constant say c 1. And this is quite easy to solve uh, d c a d r is a constant by c 1 by r and therefore, just a simple integration would give you c a equals c 1 ln r 1 by r integration is ln r plus c 2 2.4.2 dash 4. And if you substitute the boundary conditions you know you substitute r you substitute the corresponding c a you will get c 1 and c 2. So, if you do that then we have already done this on the same lines if you do this c 1 equals k times c b minus c naught divided by ln of r b by r o and c 2 will turn out to be k c b minus k times c b minus c naught ln r b divided by ln r b by r o. Okay. This is what you will find if you are unclear I would like you to stop the video here go back substitute these boundary conditions C A equals K C B at R equals R B C A equals K C naught at R equals R O into this solution here and find out C 1 and C 2 and convince yourself that it is indeed the case. Okay. Okay. Now, by substituting C 1 and C 2 back in this and by rearranging we will get C A equals K C B minus K times C B minus C naught ln r b by the radial coordinate in the thickness of the membrane divided by ln r b by r o equation 2.4.2 dash 5. And therefore, the flux at r b which is what we are required to find as a part of this problem is nothing but a diffusive flux which is given by the fixed first law minus d a b to c a do r at r equals r b. We have an expression for c a we can differentiate this with respect to r and then we can substitute that in this expression if you do that you will get d a b k c b minus c naught r ln r b by r o at r equals r b. So, you substitute r equals r b here you will get d a b k c b minus c naught r b ln r b by r o this is equation 2.4.2 dash 6. So, we have a nice concentration profile which is typically what we look at first uh, depending on what we need for our analysis or design and then in this case we are looking at uh, the flux. What I would like you to do is please use uh, a software uh, uh, spreadsheet software such as Microsoft Excel or something like that and plot this and see what the variation of C A is with R. Okay. That would be interesting that would provide insights into the way the concentration varies in the wall of the bronchiole. Okay. We are looking microscopically at that to understand that better and so on. And interestingly and in this we have seen earlier also the flux is nothing but all constants here d a b is a constant k is a constant c b is a given constant c, c b is the drug concentration in the lumen c o is the drug concentration in the tissue on the other side of the bronchial wall all are constants here r b uh, for a given bronchial r b and r o are fixed and therefore, the flux 
the molar flux of the drug turns out to be a constant at steady state. Okay. So, that these are some nice insights that we can draw which can be used in any way that you need for your purpose. Okay. Good. So, we have looked at some learning aspects first uh, to get an idea of as to how to approach this course and then we saw the application of the conservation equation to a cylindrical system in this case a drug diffusion across the bronchiole wall. When we meet next we will take things further. See. You.